I love this conversation with Sean McDevitt, aka the fitness shaman. We talk about parenting, being a conscious parent, psychedelics, theology, the history of religions and Christianity, the Council of Nicaea, and really kind of all the things that I wanted to get into conversations about when I started this podcast. We seem to cover all of them in one episode. So I absolutely loved it. Now, before we get into it, if you haven't yet subscribed, if you could hit that subscribe button, it really helps out the channel. And secondly, if you're interested in these types of conversations and you enjoy them, I host a call every Thursday where we have a conversation as a group. I'll set an intention or a theme for the call, and then we'll just dive into it and see what comes up. And I know that sometimes when you're into these types of things, it can be difficult to find community and other people that really kind of get it. So if you feel that and you feel called to it, if you hit the link in the description below, you'll be able to register and join that call for free every Thursday. And lastly, if you want to be able to find Sean on any of his channels, the links are also below. All right. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Sean, thank you for being here, brother. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Sabri. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, it's an honor and a privilege. Yeah. Thank you, man. So we just started to get into the conversation about some of your trip in Europe. And I was like, wait, let's just hit record and then let's keep going. So you said you were just in London for the last the last leg of the trip. So how was how was Europe in general? I, I saw you went to Florence, which I haven't been to, but it's on my list and it's high up my list of places I would like to go. Um, what was your experience like? I loved Florence. I really appreciate you asking about this. For your listeners, my wife and I are on the precipice of having a baby. As you well know, it apparently changes your life forever. forever. And so we thought, you know, we work a lot. We own a business together. Why don't we take this trip as a couple out of the country before we have a kid? And we went to, uh, <laughs> we packed a lot into the trip. There was a deviation that wasn't part of the original, but we went Rome, Florence, Barcelona, Paris, and London in about a 16-day span. So very, very quick. I'd been to Rome before when I was a kid with my parents. My mom actually grew up in Italy for part of her life. And so she had family friends. They thought it would be cool to introduce me to their kids type of thing. And Rome is, have you been to Rome? Yeah. It's overwhelming. And, uh, you know, my wife and I would be walking around and you see some obelisk and it's like thing 247 to see in Rome that a normal tour guide wouldn't tell you about. And it's like each corner you see something that's been there for 2000 years. Florence. We felt the food was a little bit better. We felt that the pace was a little bit more what we enjoyed. And the Statue of David, I mean, they still have amazing things to see there. And in terms of the, the history, obviously, you know, it's kind of like the seat of Western civilization. And then went to Barcelona, um, immediately witnessed a theft, which I hadn't seen since growing up in Los Angeles. And that, that really kind of rocked us. We shared it on social media. A lot of people told us similar horror stories. And grateful to say, Dela, my wife, has two stepbrothers who live in Paris. So we were like, let's try to see if we can get out of here, sort of salvage that part of the trip. Got to hang out with them in Paris, which was great because they're fluent in French. So going to different places, they were like, just tell us what you want to order. And then they would translate. And then finally made it to London. We were both kind of gassed at that point. But... I, I love the history and for, I, I think I've mentioned before hitting record, I, I studied history in college and the Brits, man, the way you guys held off the Nazis and you guys were doing it alone for a little while until Pearl Harbor happened, the U.S. got into it and seeing some of the scarring, like where you guys live, like walking around London and seeing some sort of sculpture or statue and having a little plaque that's like, yeah, the pock marks that you see here because a bomb went off in World War One or World War Two right near here. And it's a reminder of what your country went through to hold on to the world we have now. And so then the other guys, uh, the allies could get into it. I really enjoy that aspect. Um, and then fish and chips, like, you, like there's actually something to that. You guys have amazing Indian food. So we really loved it. Yeah, it's really wild that maybe one of the best things you can eat in England is Indian food. <laughs> it's the national dish, right? Yeah, literally, chicken tikka masala is like the is the national <laughs> is the national dish, which I think is actually pretty awesome. You know, when we think of like cultures mixing and that kind of becoming a melting pot, where Britain's national food is. A, a, a spin on Indian food. 
Completely agree. Also, the colonists that were in India are probably rolling in their graves that you guys now have an Indian prime minister, right? The mayor of London's Indian. The person who manages your roles is also Indian. And then amazing food. We went to Deshooms. For your listeners, highly recommend going to Deshooms if you're in London. We actually loved it so much, Sabri, that we ended up ordering it uh, takeaway. And you guys, you guys call it takeaway, not takeout, uh, which I really enjoy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love the, the British slang, man. The chin wag, uh, you know, <laughs> cheers, mate, quid, all that stuff I love. Yeah, it's funny because sometimes, you know, if I'm not thinking about how I'm speaking to, you know, the fellow Americanos, they, um, sometimes I have to think, oh, yeah, there's probably, they probably have no idea what I'm talking about if I say certain things. Yeah, we were in Florence in a line, waiting in line to see the Statue of David. And there was a couple from London and they were like, yeah, what's the price of petrol? And I'm grateful that my, my parents lived overseas a bunch. So I know petrol means gas. And then having to do the conversion because you guys have it per liter, right? The, at the petrol station and, and we have yeah. it per gallon. So he was like, oh, the petrol's through the roof, bruv. And I was like, let me do the math. And I'm like, yes, you're right. It is, it is way up there. <laughs> it is through the roof. Yeah. Actually, it's come down significantly, but it's still, it's still high. That's um, good. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you feeling about the uh about the new arrival, man? Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I think you would vibe on this. I wasn't always into having kids. And I think it's really the partner that one has. I used to be married and divorced in a previous life. I look at that as my dark night of the soul, quote unquote, which I'm sure your listeners would vibe with, where going through it at the time, very challenging. But in hindsight, it's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. It's allowed me to become the person I am now. I met my wife now. And once I met her, I was like, oh, I can now think about having kids. I have this teammate. I have this partner. I think this makes more sense. And I also looked at it as an amazing life experience. I'm a huge fan of collecting perspectives. That's why I love traveling because it helps us understand different people. And now I get to understand parents. I get to understand you, the things that you've gone through, the whole journey, and then also the challenge of trying to do better. I'm grateful to say that my parents were conscious enough to try to do better than their parents at parenting. And now my wife, Dayla, and I get that opportunity. And so it's already changed me. Like I used to have long hair. I cut that to be a little bit quicker in and out of the bathroom. I recently got LASIK eye surgery so I could get up in the middle of the night and help out taking care of the kids without fumbling for glasses, contacts. So I'm, I'm already making a lot of those changes and very excited about it. That's amazing, man. It's It definitely is an experience which I feel like you can't prepare for in the entirety of the spectrum. That's what I found um, on both the bits that were difficult and the bits that were amazing. Um, I think both at times surprised me. Um, you know, I remember, and, and I actually always share this because I think it's important for some men to hear this and some men will, might absolutely not experience this whatsoever, but I always share it just in case. I didn't feel a bond immediately with my daughter. And I really felt like, what's wrong with me? And I remember like having all this excitement that she came and it's like, I didn't really feel anything. And it really concerned me because I hadn't heard other people openly speak about this. And then when I started bringing it up, other dads would say, oh yeah, I experienced that. Which is why I kind of will be quite open about it because I'd say, for me, it was like a falling in love process. I, f I fell in love with my daughter. And it just, but I, I think I thought it was going to be this immediate thing. That's what I was told. Everyone said, oh, as soon as you see her, that's it. And then when it didn't happen, I was like, oh no, like, am I broken? What's, what's happened? <laughs> and it, it actually really shook me. And, you know, especially that was coupled up because she was being breastfed. So it's faster digesting. She was, you know, um, waking every two hours, you know, throughout the night. And I remember maybe six weeks in having not really had more than two hours sleep and I'm still working full time and, um, kind of feeling like I was losing my mind and not feeling this connection. I was like, Oh no, like, what is this? <laughs> um, and, and I think I always share that as like a, Hey, to anyone listening, you know, this might not be the case. You might have that immediate love at first sight, but, just in case, if you don't, I had it too. And then, you know, like it didn't take too long before it was like, oh, this is the love of my life. I appreciate and, you mentioning that and talking about it 
there's a great, I love quotes and analogies. And one is what's most personal is most universal. So like you said, you experience this, you're like, Oh my God, am I going crazy? You start talking about it. Other dads are like, Oh yeah, come to think of it. I went through the same thing. It's funny you mention it and I appreciate you doing so. I have another friend here in Austin who is a fellow online coach. He just had a son and he said it took like four months. And he said, all of a sudden at the four month mark, his son was like, Oh, Hey, like I know you, your dad, you know? And I, I think it's also kind of like, for whatever reason, like we have a, we have a dog and early on he really took to my wife. And then over time he was like, Oh yeah, you're, you're a parent too. Like I get this. And I know there is that special bond because you know, my wife is talking about all the times that our son is kicking and moving and I don't get to experience that. And yeah. from what I hear from you and others, that's not abnormal to be okay with that. And to, like you said, sort of allow yourself to fall in love with your kid. Yeah, it was definitely the case for me. You know, now my daughter, she's six and she's, um, she's a real character. Um, very funny, uh, intelligent, very grown up for age in many ways. Um, it's quite funny because if we're out at like a soft place, so what might that be in the U S like a jungle gym, maybe no, like, like an okay. indoor, like an indoor play center. Yeah. Where yeah gymnasium like, or something. Yeah. And you know, like so there's one at the, I say the gym we go to, it's, I guess it's more like the equivalent of a country club. And, um, there's one there for like kids. And sometimes if there are other kids her age that have like a tantrum, she'll kind of look at them and look at me like. <laughs> I, <laughs> these guys <laughs> yeah. and it's just funny because sometimes it's kids that are like slightly older than her but she looks at me like what are they doing what is this <laughs> um but yeah it's it's just a different type of it's a different type of relationship and i think um the the i would say the feeling of unconditional love from them to you is what I think is shocking. And, you know, because if you think about it, when we grow up as children, our parents love us, you know, okay, mostly, you know, our, for most people, yeah, our parents love us. And, but we, we sometimes feel it's conditional, whether it's being told off or like if, if we have to achieve or if there's any of those feelings, sometimes we can kind of feel like, love was conditional but it's interesting the other way around when it's your children because it just feels just purely purely unconditional love and i can say i've never experienced that with any other human the way that i see my daughter loves me and and how she is with me and that that's magical parents are kind of like gods to their kids right? Because especially at, at your daughter's age, six years old, like you guys seem to have it together. You know, I'm sure she looks at you and your partner as the be all end all. And that will belie that love or that trust. It's funny when I was like 19, I asked my dad, like, you guys are just winging it, huh? And he was like, Oh my God, we were just throwing shit against the wall. We had no, no idea what we were doing. And I think that's important. Like I, I want to, I don't know. I'd be curious if you share that with your daughter at times, because I would love to share that with our kids, like our son and, and other kids that we have insofar as, you know, Hey, little guy, like <laughs> we're still figuring out it as well. Like we, we have more time and you know, like you've learned a lot from this age to this age. Can you imagine how much I've learned? But like, I'm still trying to figure it out and that's okay. And when I had that conversation with my dad at 19, I also asked kind of like what's going on inside of you. And he was like, oh man, I feel the same. He was like, I feel the same as you inside. He was like, I got way more responsibility. Like my body doesn't work how it used to, but for all intents and purposes, I feel the same. And for me, that was so enlightening going forward being like, okay, it's okay to not know what I'm doing necessarily. It's okay to still feel the same as I did in my body. Like that's what the future holds. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And I think it's an important conversation to have with kids. I think it's beautiful you said that, bro, because I've had that conversation with my daughter since she was three. Love and I've, I, I'm just kind of honest with her. And, and she gets it. She actually really gets it. And what's interesting is, is because as, as conscious as we can try to be, um, and, and some people maybe find it easier than others. Maybe you know, some people are very naturally kind of placid and laid back. And I'm naturally more high tempo. And I've really had to kind of work on that over the years from, you know, from, from being young, I'm talking like 
you know, from a teenager, I've really had to kind of work on that. And whilst I'm hugely different, but th there's, yeah, there's those moments where you react or, you know, you temper a little bit and shout and, and then immediately after I'm like, ah, shit. So I then say to her, like, darling, that was, that was nothing to do with you. That was everything to do with me. Like you did do this thing, but my reaction that's on me. And then I would say like, maybe it, normally it's been at times where there's been other things in my life where maybe stress has been elevated and I've been on reduced sleep. And I'll say to her, I'll be like, you know, like these things are going on. I've not slept as well. Oh, and I haven't slept as well. Like I'll be a little bit grumpy or my patience isn't quite the same. And I know that's not an excuse, but you know, that that's what's going on. I just want you to know like how I reacted then that wasn't you. That was me. And it, what's interesting is you almost see, I, I've seen it in a way, energetically, it almost looks like she lets go of it. And it's like a, ah, oh. because the opposing is how many times the parents say, now ah, look what you made me do. And they put it on the children even more. And it's very interesting to see that, um, to almost see that energetic, like letting go of it, where she goes, oh, it's okay, daddy. And she gives me a kiss and a cuddle you allow me to talk about because I, I agree with you and i i applaud you for how self-aware you are being willing to have that conversation with a fellow human right like your your daughter is still a human at the end of the day it's something that like you said how many times do parents kind of pop off and i feel badly because my I like my love my parents are probably gonna listen to this podcast they support everything i do i'm also an only child so i'm the only one that they have to support but the story I tell a lot is they were great. You know, they never hit me and touched me inappropriately, but there were a couple of times where I messed up and they just kind of lost it on me. And I've had conversations with them about it. Like it's all good. It's water under the bridge. I've done a lot of therapy and work on myself to be fine with it. And I really wish that the next morning they would have apologized or because logically I now know like, oh, I was 10. My dad was doing an hour and a half commute each way on a good day in Los Angeles, like trying to make it work, paying the bills. And as an adult, I'm like, oh, I get it. It was nine o'clock. I did something to rattle him and he just popped off on me. However, I would have loved mm -hmm. if that next morning, you know, he comes up. He's like, hey, man, like I had this long fucking commute. I'm stressed. I got this and this going on. You know, I didn't like what you did and I want you to be better. But I shouldn't have lost my shit on you and like my bad. And it was funny to your point, Sabri, because that next morning I was almost like waiting for it. And it was almost like my parents like doubled down and like no one talked about it. And it was just like, people were kind of quiet with me and like, here's the breakfast off to school. And it was like, okay, like I'll just keep living. But I hope that, cause I'm like, I'm not going to be perfect. My wife's not gonna be perfect. And either later that night or the next morning being like, Hey man, like, dad kind of messed up, lost my stuff. Like, I still want to have that conversation with you, but you know, this is why it's not an excuse, like you said, but just understanding, because I think it is training for our kids and the next generation that like, Hey, if you kind of lose it, that's okay. And how can we get better? Like, if you don't like the way that you did it, there is a way to approach this and this is how you do it. Yeah, man, absolutely. You know, not too long ago, um, I was, I was definitely going through some, some stressful things. I was going through a relationship breakup, not with my daughter's mom. And we, we separated when she was one. Uh, so five years ago, her mom's remarried. Now I get on really well with, with her mom, with her husband. Like it's super, um, like, yeah, it's better than amicable. You know, it's really good. But, um, yeah, I was going through this relationship ending and, uh, my nervous system just felt like, uh, on edge, right? And I'd recently taken the child lock off the car door because, you know, my daughter, like she gets it, she knows. And, um, and we're driving and I just felt my nerve, like my nervous system was just on edge. I felt like I was just kind of holding it together. Like I felt a lot of, a lot of stress. Um, and it, it was, again, it was around this kind of relationship. And then I, I was feeling like a, a lot of heartbreak. And um, we were driving and she's playing with the door handle and she's used to the child lock being on. And of course it wasn't. And she's just playing with it habitually and the door opens. And I just lost my shit for about five seconds. And it was a combination of one, 
I kind of shit myself because we're driving, the doors open. Um, and I had that moment where I lost my shit and then we get to where we were going and I sat there and I just said, bless her. And it makes me feel emotional saying it. I, I, I went to apologize and she actually said to me, it's okay, daddy. I know you're stressed. You don't have to say it. <laughs> and she, cli and she climbed over and gave me a kiss and a cuddle as if to say like, Hey, I can see. I've got you. And I was like, wow. I was like the fucking level of awareness that child has that most adults don't have that. If you said that to your partner, a few seconds later, they're probably not going to say, Hey babe, it's okay. I can see you're stressed. And it was like just her level of awareness to just to know, and she didn't take it on. And, and I think maybe that's because I've had those conversations with her previously. And then normally, I'll apologize pr and pretty quickly. And, you know, this was the difference of probably, you know, two or three minutes when I got there, I was going to say, baby, I'm sorry. And as I started to, she just jumped in and said, you don't have to say it. And I was like, ah, oh, man. And of course I still did, but sure. I just thought, wow, like that's, that's a really high level of emotional intelligence and awareness <laughs> for a six year old. I would have to imagine that a lot of that's come from the relationship that you've had with her. Like you said, you've had conversations since she was, you know, two, three years old, and now she's six, kind of taking this into a direction I think you'd enjoy, and we can talk about it. Are you familiar with Dolores Cannon's work and the three waves and whatnot? I've not, Dolores Cannon, yes, but her, her work, not so much, so please tell me about it. It takes us into the woo-woo path that I, I know you're passionate about and your guests are passionate about as well. So uh, Dolores Cannon's a hypnotherapist and she found with doing work with clients, she sort of stumbled upon the woo. And I, I use the woo-woo to explain the esoteric, the spiritual, that sort of thing. So that's what I'm talking about. And when she would be working with these clients, she would get to what she eventually called the superconscious, which she later basically called the soul and that soul entity. And so she would have somebody who would come in and say, you know, hey, I'm having these shoulder problems. I've seen these individuals, doctors, whatever, no one can figure it out. So like, this is my last resort. I'm here to get hypnotized, help me out. And she would get to the superconscious, the soul entity who would basically say, this person's having this issue because of a past life trauma, or this is something that they're blind to, they have a blind spot. This is what you have to do as the therapist. And Dolores Cannon in her work, she talks about the first few times this happened, she's like happy to just work with the client. Like, hey, thanks, whoever I just talked to, like now let me work with the client. And then after this would happen over and over and over again, she started to have conversations with that super conscious, that soul entity. And with kid gloves trying to be as gentle as possible, as sensitive as possible, she would ask questions kind of like, what's going on? on your side, like what's going on over there? Where is this information coming from? And long story short, she's used that to inform her theories on what she calls the three waves. And it's basically souls coming back to raise the vibration, raise the consciousness of this earth. And those waves have somewhat culminated in potentially the kids that you're having. So like your daughter, her contemporaries, and the souls coming back being a little bit more advanced and a little bit more knowledgeable of the actual reality, quote unquote, in which we live. And so when I hear stories like you just shared, Sabri, about you and your daughter and how, quote unquote, woke she is, I, I often think about Dolores Cannon's work. Yeah, wonderful, man. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And I'd like to check her stuff out more, but I, I can see that. I can, I can really see it in her. I mean, two weeks ago, um, we went by this little, a little stall that was selling crystals and jewelry that, you know, this woman hand makes. And my daughter asked if she could have a bracelet. I said, yeah, sure. I said, uh, which one would you like? And I've, I've not told her to do this. No shit, man. She, there was the kid selection. She put a hand out, she closed her eyes and she just took a hand left to right. And then she put a hand down and chose the one that felt right. And I was just watching her and I was like, shit. <laughs> It's wild. Yeah, that's something that I think, so I buy into that. And I think we can talk about also how one's own belief system is almost a placebo for who they want to be. And I'm a huge fan of picking a belief system that's positive for oneself, 
holding on to that because even if you're just BSing yourself at the end of the day, there's a huge impact of placebo, right? And something that I buy into with the soul coming to this earth again, being in this fun meat spaceship, my parents tell stories about things that I used to do when I was a baby. Like apparently my, my dad's from a small town in Iowa, like a, a river city on the Mississippi River, small town. And he has family there. So we would go when I was a kid, you know, my grandparents lived there and a lot of family lived on the Mississippi. And so apparently one story is I'm with my dad's cousin's kid and I'm like four or five and his kids like one or two and almost fell off of the dock. But apparently like I grabbed his shirt and, and pulled him back and they all, all the parents saw it and they were just like, wow, kind of like your daughter, like, wow, this five, six year old seems to be pretty aware of this relative or other human is about to fall in. Like, let me help him my dad's parents i was grand grandkid whatever and for my mom's parents i was the only grandkid and when they would get together my mom's parents would ask my dad's parents well this must be just whatever for you because it's another grandkid amongst many grandkids and they said yes but this one's a little different like he seems to get it a little bit more than others and so i think there is something to the whole nature versus nurture conversation and maybe your daughter having a little bit more of a leg up, quote unquote, in the nature department. Yeah, I think so, man. I think so. I mean, wildly on the, I think it was the third ayahuasca ceremony I did when she was, she was one. It was a few days after her first birthday. I was actually told that I, what I'm doing now, I was told then that I'd be doing it. And I was also told that my daughter would eventually be involved and that she would lean into this. And it's interesting to see and it said how a character would be, and it's it's almost exactly as as it, as it said in this journey. Um, so, so I need to ask quite... how did you how did you schedule the ayahuasca journey? Because I'm a huge fan of psychedelics. I had a very transformational experience with Bufo five meo DMT, mm -hmm. which is sort of like that cousin to an ayahuasca ceremony. And I don't know how you would do that after her first birthday. Like I've joked with my wife like when our our kids are in daycare i feel like i can you know get it in when they're at daycare and then get back out and be available when they get home so how did you schedule that like as a new parent well it's interesting um when did i do i must have done the, the i think i did the first one just before no wait six and a half now i think i did i did the first one seven years ago so and then i think i did one when she was six months old uh, and then another one when she was one. And I guess really it was, it was just, you know, at, at the time I just, uh, yeah, you know, a, a mom kind of just took the duties and I just went and did it really. Um, it was really interesting because the second time I did it when she was six months old, I was a baby for my journey, experiencing the world as a six month old, <laughs> um, which was, which was wild. But, uh, yeah, that, that third one, it just, it told me that she was going to, lean into these things and I mean, I've got to share this story whilst we're in it. So I had Hamilton Souther on the podcast uh, a few weeks back who owns Blue Morpho Retreats. Um, he's served ayahuasca for 20 years in the Amazon. Um, and I was showing her a reel that I made with Hamilton where he's talking about existence and, and consciousness. And I had images overlaid over the top of him talking. And there's one bit where he mentions consciousness and I put an image on there, which is what I've experienced whilst in journey, where it's kind of like in the ether, you know, where it kind of feels like that, like image of consciousness that you may have seen when you do DMT, where it's like both black and a trillion colors and 7D, you know, like that kind of thing. And Oh, that, that one. <laughs> you know, that one. <laughs> so she's watching this and she sees this part of the video and she leaps forwards out of a seat and she said, is that heaven? Like she remembered it. Now you ask most six year olds what heaven looks like. And they're going to say, you know, it's, it's the clouds, it's the gates, you know, that's the image that most people have. But this one image that I perceive to be actually heaven, she reacted to it. Like she remembered it. Like it, it jolted her. Is that heaven? And I was just like, Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's said, profound. Yeah, I just said, I think it is. I think it is. That's what I hope I can be 
with our kids when they ask questions like that or like what happens after you die or this that, and the other thing asking them like what do you think because i agree that even the data on kids under seven who can remember past lives i'm sure you're up on data where they say that they were uh killed and they can point to where the bodies are and they're able to do that and it's like how are kids supposed to know this something that i've seen sabri when i've researched like how to be a good parent they're like you have an opportunity to relive being a child with the knowledge that you have as an adult and so that's where i hope i can be patient enough with my kids when they ask those questions or they say this is like da da da, da and not shut them down and be like what are you talking about but just like oh tell me more like oh the, is this heaven like why do you say that like do you remember this like trying to tap into that and getting them more curious and so uh i will <laughs> i would it's okay to have you on speed dial man at some point and be like bro like <laughs> How do, how do I respond to this? <laughs> oh, man, absolutely. I mean, but they, they, I think they just have this innate knowing. And, and, and to your point about the, the parenting side, I think it's realizing that we are, we are, we're playing the role of, yes, we are the parent and they are the child. But I think there's an equal amount of teaching going on. I think the teaching dynamic is, is a two-way thing. We're teaching them things about maybe how to be an adult or to have you know, to be responsible and to be able to function and do things. But they're teaching us how to return to a state of joy, how to see the world through fresh eyes, and 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 so many things. I think if we see it as that, I think if we see it as yes, it's it's the parent-child dynamic, but it's also teacher and teacher, and we're just teaching each other different things. Completely agree. I would buy into that. I would also add the soul family aspect. I mean, you you and I probably vibe on the same thing as my personal belief when we die is we're met by the soul family or somebody that you recognize. And that would suggest that we've done this before. So with my parents, with my partner, with our really close friends, it's I've even had this exchange with our, our mutual friend, Justin Lovato, of like, this isn't the only time we've done this, dude. So how does that welcome more understanding, more patience? And then with our kids, this, this wasn't, this isn't the first go around. Like y'all may have been, your daughter may have been your mom or your sister or whatever in another form of existence. And so it's like, how can I have that same respect towards this little individual? And it's more of a collaborative thing of like, cool. Now I'm in the adult seat and hopefully I get to do as well as, as a job as you might do, you know, um, even like, this is like a tangent, but I'm sure you've seen the jokes where someone says they've been to a party and people talk about who they were in a past life. And there's like two Napoleons and two, you know, and they kind of laugh and they'll talk about the new age or esoteric people being a little off the rocker because of those comments. I think the only way that that works is we're all everyone at some point in existence. So like you've been me at some point, I've been you. People have been Napoleon, you've been Napoleon, you know? And then all of a sudden, does that help inform us to be kinder, to treat every, because it's like, I might, I might be you in another life. So let me, let me be nicer in this uh, situation. Like talking about our European trip, there, there were multiple individuals who didn't even speak the same language or there was, a, there was a language barrier and it was just like being a little bit kinder or, you know, being a little bit more patient or not being the stereotypical American on this trip. And all of a sudden you could see visibly their defenses or whatever drop. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, wow. Like I can actually talk to this person. And I think when we operate under that assumption that man, I could be you in a next life or a former life and vice versa. Does that allow us to be kinder to each other? Yeah, that's a great point, man. And, and it's also, I love the concept and, and, and even if we aren't each other in a different life, but it's that recognition that in this life, like we are actually each other, just having a different experience. Right. It's like, do, do we need this as a reason? You know, it's like the, the age old conversation about religion and some people saying, well, if there wasn't religion, we would all just be these apes that run around and no morals, no ethics. And I don't really buy into that. Cause it's like, why do you need a reason to be a good person? So that's why I agree with you. Like even, if the exhausting example I just used of maybe we're everybody at some point, even if you take that away, like, why can't you still be kind, compassionate, empathetic? 
Yeah, I I don't think I don't think religion stops people from being bad people. I think what it does help with is a framework for when people have maybe just missed the mark, which which is the the, the original Hebrew um, translation for sin is to miss the mark, which a lot of people don't realize. So, well, so actually that gives a very different understanding of sin, which makes it a lot less about judgment and being a bad person and realizing that, you know, you're just kind of missing the point. So there are certain things that we can do where if now we're here, ah, that's a sin. It's not you're a bad person. You're being like naughty boy, Sean, very bad boy. No, it's, no, no, hey, man, hey, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. This is what it's about. That's got a very different feel to it. And I think that is maybe what some of religion was really meant to be about, is giving a framework and some guidance of sometimes this ego can get a little out of check or we can get a bit wild, we can get a bit carried away. And I think the idea is to kind of remember what we are beyond the mind and beyond the the body and, you know, remember the soul and the spirit and what we are beyond. That That's, that's my sensibility. And I think at some point then egos get involved into the into the thing that was very first created to help you manage it and their ego takes over <laughs> i completely agree i appreciate you giving me that nugget i'm going to borrow that about sin and the hebrew translation because i agree with you sabri now all of a sudden it becomes a mistake and it's like mistakes can be righted mistakes can be corrected and it's not this you're going to be you know damned to hell for the rest of eternity I also vibe with you 100% on religion providing structure to spirituality because it takes a lot of work, man. Like I had to have a dad who was very skeptical of religion and I've had conversations with him. Me and my dad are really close. He, he just dropped little like breadcrumbs and I asked him as an adult, I was like, did you know what you were doing with these little like just where the, the healthy bit of cynicism, you know, with the established order? And he was like, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was laying out the breadcrumbs hoping you would kind of pick them up. And then I happened into ecclesiastical history courses in college just because I loved history. I was a collegiate swimmer. I needed to get out in four years. History kept me awake. I was able to take classes, right, and do well. And learning more to your point about the role man has had in religion. And then getting out of that and going through an atheist period and then having my experience with psychedelics being like, okay, now I think I would describe myself more as agnostic. You can't really see it, but I have an entire shelf here that's all spiritual books, that's all, you know, getting into the weeds. I had to do all that work to get to this belief system spiritually that works for me. And it would have been a lot easier if I had someone without ego who was like, here's the structure, you know, from an early age, like, here you go. But the ego is what gets in, in the, into the, you know, in between that and humans have their own desires. Like just some fun facts. Do you know why priests can't marry in Catholicism? No. It's because they used to, and when they have kids, they would divide up the church's land for those kids because that's what you do, right? And so the Pope was like, can't have that. I can't have you dividing up my land. So boop, you guys are celibate. So I get to keep all of the land, right? When we were in Rome, we were in the Colosseum and our tour guide, which was amazing, like highly recommend a tour of the Colosseum for anybody who goes to Rome. Our tour guide said that a lot of people believe that uh, execution stopped when Christians came in and, and took over Rome. And she was like, they just stopped at the Colosseum and they instead had them at the Vatican. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, like they're, you know, so when one understands the history of religion, you see a lot of the role that man has played in it. And it would be really nice to have this no ego structure for people who are interested. Yeah. And, and I think that was the origin of, I think all religions began as spiritual teachings. And then I think they became religion when, when the dogma was kind of involved and, you know, when, when man came in and wanted to take control of it, I think then it became religion. But I think pre, pre that, I think it was just spiritual teachings. I'm curious your religious path in a nutshell, like how did you, you know, your, your daughter is growing, she's there already, man, but how did you get to where you are? Well, um, I had, I have a mildly, I'd say mildly Christian 
mother. Um, you know, she's not like super religious, but she she believes and she she has a Christian faith. Um, my dad was raised Muslim in North Africa. Um, didn't practice, lived here. I would say he's non-religious for for most of the time that I knew him. Um, and before he, he passed away nearly five years ago, but before he did, uh, maybe a few years before that, he turned to Christianity and started going to church, um, you know, which, which was interesting. And so for me, uh, I was pretty much, I would say atheist. I was very much in the left brain, uh, linear thinking, uh, can't prove it, then don't believe it. Um, and, and that was, I guess the camp I was in, I would say until I, I had ayahuasca that gave me, that really opened me up and I was like, okay, wow. I, I now have a completely different reference for what God is compared to what I've been told God is everywhere else that I've looked before. So that gave me a, a big shift, but I think what really took me down a path of being very interested in the teachings of Jesus and, and not necessarily Christianity, but, um, I've told this story before, but two and a half years ago, I had an event happen. Um, I'd never heard of channeling, didn't know what it was. And it was the 22nd of November, 2020. And after doing some fasting and been for a long walk, extended meditation, I then began to write and I wrote for two hours and it wasn't my thoughts. And it was biblical and there was passages out of the Bible and I've never read a Bible. Um, but it was actually pointed to the deeper spiritual truth that gets completely missed and what the depth behind some of the things are. And there's literally those passages in there then writing what that actually meant. And it wasn't just an intellectual thing. It was a transformative experience where I, it was, it was wild. Like I've not eaten like sh real sugary foods, like kind of, you know, cake or chocolate or candies or cookies or anything like that for since that day um wow. and like sodas as well um if you could recommend that channel to come visit me and like get me get because i have a huge sweet tooth that's been the toughest for me <laughs> yeah me too me too and literally that day it wasn't just that it's like i realized what i was i realized what all the deeper spiritual teachings were that just get missed and i felt like I embodied it. It actually felt like I'd, I'd taken ayahuasca and I hadn't. Um, and then I just started listening to things that Jesus would say. And I felt the underlying spiritual teaching in it where it was, it's so many things are so profound and, and I, people miss it. People really miss it. And, um, it, it just left me in a place where I f it felt undeniable that no, no this, this person definitely existed and there was profound spiritual teaching there and it's not obvious. It's not, you just hear it and that's it. You have to hear it and you have to sit with it, sit with it and, and really think and feel what, what did he really mean when he said that? Because he said he spoke in parables for a reason. And I would sit with it and I'd be like, holy shit. That is profound. <laughs> it's funny that I use holy shit as a term <laughs> to describe the profoundity. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I don't consider myself a, a religious person per se, um, just a, a spiritual person. I mean, we're all like, how can we, how can we not be spiritual? Because we're all spirit. Um, but the actual deep spiritual teachings are something that I just feel, I feel it in my body. And, uh, and now I actually have access to that kind of channel pretty on like pretty open on tap, um, where I can ask things. And sometimes I have no idea what the, the next word that's going to come out of my mouth if I drop in. And sometimes I don't really remember what I've said. So <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> oh, I, I really appreciate you sharing. I, I buy into it. You know, I try to, when I've done, so I, I wrote a book and a lot of the times I would try to be in that space and just open myself up to, you know, what, 
sort of being the instrument, right? And so what needs to flow through me? And it was so funny, Sabri, because I'd hear my wife in another room and I'd be writing and I'd be like, oh, okay. And it, like you, you know, I, I had a direction, I had a structure, but it felt like I was just writing and it wasn't, I was thinking about it. And as I'd write certain words, I would hear literally my wife say the same word from another room in a different conversation. And I'd just be like, ooh, yeah, that's like, I'm really tapping in. A few things for your listeners that I think might be helpful. Are you, are you familiar with the Thomas Jefferson Bible? No. Nah. So I, it's around here somewhere. I have a ton of books, but Thomas Jefferson was a flawed individual. However, he wrote a Thomas Jefferson Bible where it's just what Jesus talked about. And so it's only where Jesus is quoted. It's only where Jesus was doing something and everything else in the Bible is gone. So it's a very, very slim volume. However, it's to your point, the teachings of Jesus. Also, what, again, we forget is the hand that man has had in the modern religious practices so the Council of Nicaea, 315 AD, Constantine, I see you nodding, you're aware. So for your audience, Constantine meets with the archbishops at the time, and they determine, among other things, the divinity of Christ. Was he a god or was he a god in man form? And oh, by the way, whichever way you go, the opposite is now heretics punishable by death. So like, I wonder why he was motivated to make certain decisions. And then also the books of the Bible. And so we have the apocryphal texts like the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, the Gospel of Thomas that were found later with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were excluded. And there were also this huge Gnostic sect of Christianity that was excluded. And I think when you get to the Gnosticism, you start to be, oh man, like this guy was on some, you know, very good shit. And it also aligns with, you know, Buddha. I, I would say the big three for me are Jesus, Buddha, and Krishna. Those three, like, have you read the, the uh, Bhagavad Gita? I haven't, no. I don't know that I should do. But it's, it's so great because it, I joke that it's like a Jesus story, but it's like as if Jesus was, uh, he knew he was Jesus and he was doing water to wine every weekend. Like uh, when Krishna is talking to his disciple, he's very much like, oh, I, I know I'm Jesus and I'm out here, you know, making a difference. But the things that he talks about, I'm like, just insert Christ. And it's the same thing. And then also fast forward to the new age stuff. There's at least five books that you can get on Amazon about people who think the Bhagavad Gita is simply a psychedelic like Bible and like how to get through a psychedelic journey. And so for me, when stuff rhymes like that and you have across cultures, when you, when you drop the bullshit, like you said, when you drop the other stuff in, in the Bible, you start realizing like he was talking in parables all of a sudden, like it starts to make sense and creates a picture in my opinion of the reality that it seems like you and I both buy, buy into and then others you've had on your show. I love it, man. I love that you shared about the Book of Enoch and the Gospel of Thomas. I was literally talking about that yesterday just to a friend in a regular conversation. Um, yeah, and and the Gnostic stuff as well. Um, I was I had this wild experience, man. Wild experience. Um, a shaman told me that she had a vision that I was a Gnostic in a past life. And then... I was on the phone to my friends and he started telling me about this past life thing that he'd experienced where, um, it was, it was in Delphi, um, in, in Greece. And, um, he just started to, he started telling me about it. And he started to read this passage and he said in the year, and then I just thought he was going to say 14 was going to be mentioned. And my birthday is the 14th of May. And it just came up. And he said, in the year 1405, my birth is 14. So over here in, in the UK, we go, we go yeah, day. Yeah, you're right. yep, yep, yep. So it's, yeah, May 14th. And I was like, whoa. I was like, that, I was like, stop. That's, that's wild. I thought you were going to say 14 and literally it's my birthday. Then my friend starts losing his mind because his great aunt had left him a load of spiritual books. And he had this one book that was open on a music stand. It had been there for two years. He'd never actually looked at the book. And he literally starts losing his mind on the phone. And he's like, bro, he sent me a, a, a photo of this page where it was open. Like the sixth word, word along is Delphi. And it's talking about Gnostics. And we were both just like, this is wild. This is wild. <laughs> yeah, I love those moments. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But no, I think to your point about, about the Gnostics, and I think this is something that people completely forget and how the, like a lot of the Gnostics, you know, were kind of persecuted and, um, and these much, much deeper kind of spiritual teachings and, and mysticism, 
as well you know really kind of similar to i guess like like kabbalah to to the torah maybe you know um the same kind of, mm, yeah and it, it's it's fascinating it's fascinating when you start to realize some of the bits that have been pulled away and left out and then you know the things that are coming up around evidence of psychedelics being used in early religion like there's the um, immortality key i don't know if you've read right yeah there. i have it behind me yeah, yeah it's one that you yeah. can kind of see on the end here yeah <laughs> and then listen to him on joe rogan and whatnot um so yeah not only the in the what illusion uh ceremony with marcus aurelius going also I don't think it's an accident that Marcus Aurelius was regularly going to these festivals. And then he's now known as one of the greatest Stoics. Like Dayla and I, as I told her that someone needs to monitor this, but we went to the Coliseum and then immediately watched Gladiator. Like, and I was like, this has got to happen at scale. Like how many times do people go to the Coliseum and then watch Gladiator? And we're watching it. And I was like, you know, Marcus Aurelius is a real person. And I was like, he, he was as cool as they're kind of making him out to be as a person. And I started to read her some quotes from him. And she was like, what was this guy on, you know, over 2000 years ago that he was thinking in this way. And I don't think it's an accident that he was going to partake in what we now understand to probably be psychedelic ceremonies and then goes and writes all of these things that we now are sort of the basis of stoicism. Um, in addition to all of the Christmas myths with the uh, Amanita Muscara mushroom under the coniferous trees, the iconography of Christ with the circle and all that stuff, like it is uh, it is sort of Da Vinci Code-esque or conspiracy theory-esque where these little like veins or arteries that for people who are aware enough, they can pick it out and be like, oh, we're not getting the whole story here. Yeah, and if you think about it, it's like what it's not a crazy conspiracy. If you really think about it, for anyone that's taken psychedelics, that's taken like a good mushroom trip or even, you know, LSD, um, but especially things like ayahuasca and, and DMT, like most people experience that connection to the divine. And you know, for the, all the stories we get told at school about if you take LSD, you're gonna jump off a skyscraper because you think you can fly. And then you take it and actually you just feel this connection to the divine and extreme amounts of love and empathy and connection. And you think, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, and, and then you realize how beautiful they are and that these things, I mean, if you know, LSD is in its original form, you know, as ergots and you know, growing off like, you know, wheat or, or rye and then mushrooms, which just grow naturally and ayahuasca vine. And it's like, these things, if there is a God that is believed so within religious dogma, then did, didn't God create these things? And is it like in the same way that we could eat a carrot or that we could eat regular mushrooms and regular mushrooms gives us vitamin D or you know, different foods going to give us nutrients? It, do we think it's an accident that there are certain plants that it's not just they do it to us because it's actually a two-way relationship. We're actually co-creating the experience it's it's because the mushroom on its own is just the mushroom but it's when it's the mushroom is where we come together now we're in this experience and do, do we think that if there is a god in the dogmatic way that a lot of religious people in the more abrahamic religions look at gods why wouldn't have god have created those for us to be connected to god the fact that you take them and then feel connected to god like why, why wouldn't, like, it just doesn't make sense that, well, why wouldn't God have given those two us to be connected? Completely agree. It's funny. I'm very grateful to have known and interacted with a lot of Mormons. You know, that's these seemingly are just in the United States and I'm not sure how much you know about their religion, but the history of how it was founded, very fascinating, especially when you look through it, when you look at it through the lens of spirituality, woo woo, you know, kind of opening yourself up to stuff. But they would talk to me about, you know, I'd, I'd have lunch meetings or a breakfast meeting in an old life with someone who's Mormon in Salt Lake City or Park City, and they're not having coffee, you know, they're not, they're not going to be drinking. I love it because they were early conferences. In a past life, I did sales. And so, you know, New York, LA, Vegas, you're up until 4 or 5 a.m. And in Utah, they'd be like, all right, it's 11 p.m. We're, you know, packing up. We'll see you guys in the morning. And because they're not drinking, they're not staying out super late. And my friends would say that we'd make, you know, because it's not it's just there. 
and they were like, it kind of gets a pass in the Mormon religion. Like they're not screaming, go out and smoke weed, but they don't look at it in the same way as alcohol. They don't say, look at it the same way as, as coffee in their religion because it's there. And they were like, God is infallible. It's there for us. And we didn't have to do anything to it. And so, you know, it's not really that bad. And to that point, I was kind of, I was listening to Seth Rogen the other day about how he feels weed prepares him for the world. And the guy interviewing him was like, can you unpack that? And he said, we don't think about it in this way, but like, we, we, we have to wear clothes. He was like, I have to wear my underwear outside. Like I have to wear shoes. And so he was like those things to your point about the carrots and the other food that we eat that prepare us for this world. He was like, weed's a plant. And he was like, we we've been smoking it. We've been using it in ceremonies or otherwise for eons. So why is this any different from toilet paper from a beanie when we're cold, this is preparing us for the world and we didn't have to make it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and I guess you know the, the conspiratorial bit that comes up for me is that I I believe that these were restricted, so people didn't have a direct line to the divine, and instead you had to come and you know be within the the hierarchy and sit under, and which again it's funny because what what would Jesus say? He would kind of mock the he would mock the people for going to the synagogues, and you have to you don't have to go to you know, a, a place to find God, because God is always within you. He would talk about going to the mountains to pray. He would say that going to nature is the best place to connect to God, because God is all around you. And these concepts that were completely the opposite, that are now just kind of normal within Christianity, he would talk about, he would mock the robes, the fancy robes that the rabbis would wear. And now what do we have in, you know, in, in, in Christianity and Catholicism? So, yeah, I, if anything, I, I just think that maybe the conspiratorial bit is I think these things were banned and outlawed because, again, ego wants to have control. And if everyone can just go and have these substances and get this, not just an understanding of God, but get a direct connection and feeling God all through them and the realization of, oh, wait, God isn't just something external to me. God is through me and me all the time. Ah, okay, like that that changes the landscape and maybe i'm redundant now if i have this this house of god well you don't need to come to my house anymore if you can just access god whenever wherever you like yes and i'm glad you touched on that sabri because not many people i think look at the i don't i wouldn't even argue like conspiratorial but i, I think it's a great word for it governments of today have replaced the church of 500 years ago because the quotes attributed to mark twain history doesn't repeat itself but it sure does rhyme if you look at the inquisitions of the past, if you look at the way Copernicus and others who were looking out were treated, right? It was challenging the earth centric view. And it was saying like, I don't, I don't think the sun's, I don't think we're, you know, the sun's revolving around us. I think we're revolving around the sun and other plants are doing this. What did the church do? They killed those people or they locked them away, you know, and threw away the key. They were preventing us as humans from looking out. And now, LOL, surprise, surprise, 21st century, 20th century, we're looking inward. Government's like, oh, you can't have that. You can't smoke weed. You can't do psychedelics. We can't have that. We can't have you questioning what we're doing. And I, I hope in, in time, the future humans look back and be like, wow, the church as primary institution was stopping us from looking out. And then they changed their tune. And thankfully, we're starting to change our tune on those substances, medicines, quote unquote, that can be used to look inward. Yeah, I think we're seeing a really interesting time where there does seem to be a shift and, and it feels like the existing systems are very shaky right now. Very shaky. Yes, I, I hope that like here in Texas, uh, you know, the rest of the country is really getting on board with marijuana and you look at places like Denver and the state of Oregon with psilocybin now are starting to think more progressively and I'm still in the backwoods here in Texas and it's really behind. And I'm starting to realize that this may be the last state to sort of even get to the, the marijuana side of the table. However, I think you know, I was, I was listening to John Oliver about this and he was saying, this is like the seventies, the sixties and seventies when we seemingly had a chance and we kind of fumbled, uh, you know, or, or insert term as far as taking it to the finish line Versus now, it seems to be happening again. However, we have big pharmaceutical companies who are 
trying to patent, uh, like they're even trying to patent psychedelic uh, ceremonies. And like, even they're trying to patent like talk therapy involving psychedelics. And John Oliver was making fun of them in so far as you can't patent therapy, you know, you can't patent a conversation. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Cause I, I know there's people like you and me, the people you have on your show. And then I know there's the general public and people that I've talked to her in the general public. There's certain individuals who they say aren't that abrasive and they'll listen to them. And then they'll say, there are these other people who seem to be up in the air and they may not be helping the cause just from what I'm hearing the general public. And I think for you and me, we vibe on it. For your guests, for your listeners, we vibe on it. The general public, like how do we bring them along without scaring them, right? Because here in the United States, we have Aaron Rodgers talking about ayahuasca, the, the NFL quarterback. I'm grateful that he's talking about it. However, I don't know if he's doing it in as an intelligent of a way as I would like to bring the general public with him. Mm. And that's what I hope that we do. I'd be curious your take on that as well. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think I think that's part of the power of of podcasts and actually people feeling okay with talking about it and putting it out there. And I think what we're seeing more and more now, and let me say this in the right way, because I don't mean offense when I say this, and I don't think it'll be taken by anyone, and I think you'll get what I mean. But if you take a look at you and I, we maybe don't look like the typical people that at one time society would have considered the people that are taking the psychedelics and talking about love, light, and spirituality. And I think, you know, and I, and I kind of had this feeling with like with Justin or with Zach Blakeney and, you know, and, and you know, I, I guess Joe Rogan would be the poster boy for it. It's at one time, maybe it was correlated with quote unquote hippies. And people that almost seem like they didn't want to fit in with regular society. And I think what we're seeing now is, is more and more people where to the everyday person would look at someone like you and I, and we, we look like one of them. And for people listening, I'm doing like some quotation marks. Um, and I think actually that kind of lowers the guard a little bit. It almost lowers the defense where we being more relatable where, you know, the, I guess the, the country club that I go to, you know, a lot of people that go there in the city that I'm in are generally kind of for this city, it's the more successful people. And I'm having these conversations all the time. And because I'm in you know, kind of decent shape and I articulate myself pretty well and I drive a fairly nice car and, and those things, it, it's almost like they're not going, oh, like, who is this guy talking about? they actually meet me with more intrigue because I think it's more relatable. And I think we're seeing more of that now. I think we're seeing more people that are kind of just relatable and, and going beyond that, people that are also in good physical shape, that are into fitness, into health, that are well-read, educated, and are talking about spirituality, psychedelics, and that. And I think that actually is really important for this to be spread into more mainstream culture. I really appreciate you touching on that because I think that's how we do it. And so for anybody who's listening, trying to meet that person who some people may say are more asleep or are not as conscious and meeting them where they are with their level of understanding and then bringing them over. It's like Dolores Cannon talks about this as well, actually. With, there's the people who are no matter how much positivity you throw at them no matter how much you're trying they, they'll never get there but there are those people it's it's like in america with our unfortunate two-party system there's people in the middle and if you're on one side or the other those are the people that you can bring over it, with certain arguments versus the person who's on the other side of the spectrum like you're probably never going to get that person and so mm -hmm. I, I agree with you Sabri. how can we connect with those people who are maybe in the margins and show them like hey i'm, I'm a functioning human and I still have these wild out there theories about life that other people agree with me on. And if you want to have a conversation, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. But past that, like you said, you know, how's the weather? How's the favorite? You know, what match are you going to this weekend? Like I can have that conversation in addition to the more esoteric, spiritual for those people who want to go there. It's funny, you know, when we were in Paris, my uh, wife has two stepbrothers who are French and one of them is 25 and he's, he'll probably be like a PhD in psychology. 
and we're walking through the Louvre and he brought up psychedelics and I was like, oh, you don't say, you know, and I've never had this conversation with him. And I just started probing and Dayla was joking like, wow, you, you hit on, you know, a favorite topic of Sean's. And I was like, did you like, did you know this about me? I was like, cause he follows us. He listens to some of my content. And he said, I had no idea. He said, you guys just asked me like, what have I been into lately? And he said with the programs he's in for school, the data now around psychedelics and depression and whatnot, he said, it's too much to ignore. And so he said that he's taken some classes. He's looking at a certification. He's thought about guided ceremonies. I've been fortunate enough to host half a dozen or so guided ceremonies officially. Like I used to kind of do them for friends, you know, in my earlier psychonaut days, but being able to have that conversation with him, who's coming at it from a purely intellectual educational standpoint of like, this is what I'm learning in university. And now being able to talk to me about it and making it more normalized. I think that's where we need to get to. Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, it's so important. And to your point, it's, it's, it's become undeniable in the studies. And when something becomes undeniable, what do you do? And actually, you know, looping back to what you said about big pharma and, and government and big pharma and how you could say they are replacing religion in a way. If you think about it, when you mentioned the Council of Nicaea, what did they do the, you know, Christianity largely be, belonged to the peasant and the, and the slave class. And there's that kind of, it's rising more and more. And then there was this, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And to, to your point, that's when they had the conversation. Okay. Like what are we going to do here then? And it feels like we're again, history is, it's rhyming right now where we're seeing that with psychedelics, where it's, it's growing more and more, it's becoming undeniable. So now the pharma companies are going, all right. Okay. Like how do, how do we get involved? How do we create a monopoly around this? Or how do we get our hooks in? And I think it's just so important for people not to be kind of pulled by that and allow their sovereignty and their like, you know, not, not, not to be taken by, by that and try to patent talk therapy. It, it, and, and I think it's, it actually feels like a last desperate move. I think that is real kind of desperation moves the way that like, you know, if a couple, if their relationship hasn't been good for a while, and then one person might start trying to pull out some real, like, like desperation moves to try and cling on to the thing that they know is about to end. And that to me, that trying to patent talk therapy and with psychedelics seems like the kind of like the awareness of, okay, this, sh the ship's sinking. I can um, see that it's, it's indicative of we are winning quote unquote and these older institutions are starting to fight back and going to extreme measures because like in texas weed is illegal uh grateful to say the county that austin is de decriminalized i can still get marijuana you know if, if you came to visit i could hook you up with multiple individuals my point being there's a law and people are still like no i'm not going to listen to that you know to a certain degree right because here in Texas, you can't commit a crime. And if you have weed, they're going to tack that on. Right. But I've even walked around the city of Austin with a joint. And if a cop is nearby, they're just like, Hey man, can you put that out? Like, yeah, no problem. You know? Um, and so I see to your point, these institutions starting to go to those extreme measures, but people are still going to have the ceremonies regardless of a pharmaceutical company patenting something it's, it's going to happen. I'd be curious your take, because I want to mention four listeners who you have, who may be newer to psychedelics, as I've progressed in my psychonaut experiences, I now look at them as so sacred that like, I've definitely been the person who did mushrooms at a show. And now I'm in a corner, like contemplating life. Right. And then now it's, I have guides or it's me in nature with a pen and paper. It's me and a, and a close friend or relative doing similar. It's not going to a party, it's not going out and doing these other things. That's what I would recommend for people who are listening, who are like, Oh my God, psychedelics, I got to do them. Like trying to do them in the right way. What would you say about that? Yeah. I love that you brought that up. It's, um, I've never done them in a party environment. My first experience of a state altering substance outside of alcohol was ayahuasca when I was 28. Wow. Dude, I, I applaud you for just diving right in. That's challenging. Like when I did Bufo, my guides were like, oh, you've done psilocybin enough. This will be an easy route. But I cannot imagine doing what you did. So kudos to you. 
I think it's because I never had any, um, I was never drawn to taking state altering drugs. Like uh, I've said this a couple of times on, on, on the podcast, but you know, 2012, I'd competed in bodybuilding. I owned a martial arts school. Um, I was, I was just really kind of focused on health, fitness, discipline, and, and I wasn't really interested in state altering drugs, but then as I kind of deepened my personal development or growth journey, which led to spiritual, it just called me more and more. And I first knew about ayahuasca 11 years ago, and it wasn't until seven years ago when I first did it. And that was in ceremony. And now someone I've taken, even when I've taken LSD or mushrooms with friends it's been at home and we've kind of then gone out in nature and and it's it's been great because there has been though we're just laughing and we're kind of really been in that human experience of experiencing the beauty of the physical where we're laughing we're eating food we're like oh my god one of my friends started crying because of how good the food tasted <laughs> um we're listening to music we're just feeling it in the soul then we're having the deeper meaningfuls um but it's in like in this kind of to me, I, I see it like like acid or, or mushrooms, and, and I would take them, I have taken them alone as well, where I then go deep into kind of thought and introspection. But actually, I really like them as a way of, with, with your close soul family, where you can take it and you all kind of get that um, uh, collective, like a rising of consciousness together. But you're also really getting the most out of the human experience as well, where the thinking mind is almost out the window and it feels like we're almost here doing what we're meant to be doing. We're just laughing. We're like playful. We're feeling joy, gratitude, love, connection, and all the most beautiful things about the physical experience and the human experience we're getting to share. And although it's not sacred in the sense of lighting the candles, burning the incense and playing the Icaros, it actually feels sacred because that deep, connection in that way that is part of the sacred experience of of being human i love that that was beautiful i completely agree and in, in the soul family part how i would define that as people that one really trusts and it's like it's funny i've done psilocybin more times than i can count and i recently just recently this year had my first bad trip quote unquote but it was and this is where i'm like okay there's synchronicities there's something to this reality it was with my best friend of 30 years who's also done psychedelics and has a wife who's very passionate about it. And it was just the two of us. And it was, it was great. And we made, he made jokes about, we had a dinner reservation. He was like, we can still make the resi bro, you know, hang in there type of thing. But after the fact, kind of looking back on it and wow, I got to have this experience with my best friend. And I had told him before the trip that he's one of the only individuals who I feel like I can be my complete self. And he's not going to judge me. I can say whatever I want. We can have those conversations. And then we have this bad trip and we got on the other side of it. And he was like, that really stuck with me of this person isn't going to judge me. I could run around the room. I could projectile vomit. I could do whatever, you know, and we're still going to be friends and we're still going to be brothers after this. And that's what I would recommend for your audience. Cause I think that's what sometimes is missing with people who like you and I, are very passionate about psychedelics is having that little asterisk of mm -hmm. if it's not in a ceremonial way, if you don't have a guide, that's okay. Are you still doing it with some care, with some attention? Um, because you can have the, the intention can be have fun with my friends and like, enjoy this meal in this time with my friends. That's okay. Yeah. I, that's a really, it's a really good point. You say that because I would say first and foremost, if you've never experienced it being in ceremony with a guide, I think that is, the best way of doing it and treating it in a sacred manner where you're actually preparing for it with respect and honor. Uh, I think that is the ideal. But then if it's not going to be that in a place where you feel very comfortable, where you feel very safe, where if you do feel uneasy, you know, you could go lay down in bed or, you know, in, in a space in the, in the house or wherever you are, where you would feel okay. And you can just relax. And with people that you trust, you know, that, that they're also going to be, holding space and be able to kind of like give you some comfort and give you what you need in that. I think that makes for an environment. I mean, when people say to me, Oh, I wouldn't do mushrooms. I did it this one time in Amsterdam. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, like this place that you're not familiar with. It's your first time in the city. You're in the middle of nowhere in a busy bar taking mushrooms. I, I don't know how I would feel about that. Oh, I have a good friend who the first time she did LSD was at 
a very it was hard summer music festival in Southern California, which is a like headbang EDM show all day festival. And she said that a friend just get, and I know the friend and I want to I just shake him, you know, and I'm like, what are you doing? Because <laughs> She said he just gave like, hey, take this. And she was like, OK. And then the rest of the day just melted away. She had a horrible experience and was like, why would anyone do this? And it took mm. her years to be OK with even just taking a little bit of mushrooms and seeing how she felt. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you when I hear some of these stories. I'm like, how, how are people doing it like this? Uh, because there, there is an easier way uh, to have those experiences and have something positive come out of it versus being scared of it. I would also say, too, the intention aspect. Like to your point, Sabri, about around being with your mates, being with good people and having that intention, I would argue that's even with alcohol. Like I'm, you don't strike me as a big drinker. I'm not a huge drinker. However, if it's a holiday and my mother-in-law, who I'm super close with, brings out an amazing bottle of wine and she's like, you know, hey, it's, it's Christmas or it's American Thanksgiving, let's all enjoy this. I'm like, yes, please. Like, th you know, throw me a glass. Let's enjoy that as a family as soul family, as really close individuals and have an amazing conversation and enjoy it, da, 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 right? Versus it's a random Wednesday, I'm stressed. Now I'm popping open the bottle of wine and I'm really not thinking about it. I think that intention piece, we could apply that to more than just psychedelics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, hey, you know, I love what you said there. I've not had this thought before, but it just came up. So I want to share it. Even setting that intention just when you go and hang out with your friends, even if you're not taking any substance, just setting intention because we, you know, I will do that with psychedelics, but how about we do that just all the time, you know, set the intention. Like what does that do to the energy? What does that do to the experience? hundred percent uh, being more, <laughs> more intentional with life in general. And I think that's for the non psychonaut, the non woke person, quote unquote, is being more intentional about life and not just being at the whims of what you encounter but knowing that you have a little bit more control, you have a little bit more power per se when applying intention on your life. Like, okay, what do I want to get out of this? Like, it's even in such secular sense, I was listening to an NBA player in, in you know, National Basketball Association here in the States. And he was telling a story in high school how he was starting to hit an upper limit from sophomore to junior year. And he really wanted a division one scholarship that was important to him. And so for whatever reason, he started, he recorded an alarm that he would wake up to every day that would tell him how many points he was going to score and what he was going to average and how he was going to get to school. And then he said that that intention led into the work, led into the drive, led into the hours that he spent in the gym and the weight room. And then he said he started to, you know, one of the big games, he told his dad, this first game of the season as a senior, I'm going to score 50 points. He said, I scored 54. And he said, no, I have to average 25 points a game for colleges to pay attention to me. And I was scoring 27 points a game. But he said, I, I basically like spoke it into existence. And so I'm just mentioning that as an example of applying intention to non uh, substances and just applying intention to our life and then watching what happens. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. That, that intention. And also, I think sometimes that that feeling, you know, we've mentioned this earlier, can come through us, can't it? And I think if we have the intention, especially with sometimes we get a, a calling where we feel like something's meant to happen, if we can align our attention intention with with that i think that's when it becomes super powerful they say in swimming because i was a competitive swimmer i swam from the university of georgia mm. they say where, where your eyes go your head goes so in swimming you want to be hydrodynamic so you want to be in a straight line but if i start looking up my head's going to come up and now it's it's taking on water right and it's going to slow me down and i know you vibe with the whole where our attention goes you know our, our intention flows or that sort of thing I truly believe that because you see it physically as well. Like for anybody, if you just look up, you notice your head start to go with it. So it's like, oh, okay, where I'm focusing, that's where my life's going to go. And so whether it's journaling, goal setting, you know, affirmations, intentions, trying to apply that to our waking life. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, I didn't realize that was a thing in swimming, but it makes sense. I know the people that know how to ride, uh, ride motorbikes, it's the same thing. You, you, you don't look at the obstacle, you look at the gap that you want to go through. You look at the obstacle, you're going to go right at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that recently in a skiing context. And they said that, you know, alpine skiers, if you focus on the tree, you're going to hit the tree. But if you focus on the path and the snow, you, you won't hit any of the trees. Yeah, I love that, man. Um, so I'm aware that you've got, um, you know, you've got to be uh, on time. So 
we will wrap up. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I've absolutely loved this conversation and I feel like we could have done another, the same again, to be honest. I feel like the time has gone really quickly and there's a whole load of things that I wanted to ask you that I haven't done. So I feel like I want to say in advance, I'd love to have you on again. So I can actually ask you some of the things that I'd planned to, but it's, the time has seemed to have uh, it's vanished. Well, I really appreciate you having me on, Sabri. Um, also, I'm happy to go over uh, a little bit too. I, I know I gave you a hard stop, but I would love to connect with you a little bit after we stop recording as well, because I think I have some guests who would be an additional value add to your show. I would love to come back. I would love to have you on our show as well um, and continue these conversations because it's. I'm very grateful to live in 2023 where it's coming up on what, like 6, 6 p.m. your time and it's noon my time on the same day. And it's really cool to be able to have these types of conversations because like I said, you're scratching an ish for me, brother, that I don't really get to scratch all that often. And to be able to connect across oceans and have these conversations, I would love to keep having them. So uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. I would love to come back. Yeah, I love that, man. Um, I'll put all the links in the description, in the show notes for people to be able to find you. Um, but Instagram, is that the best place? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. Instagram is the best way to reach me. It's at fitness shaman. After you've listened to this podcast, dear listener, you probably understand the shaman aspect of things. Fitness is because that's a little bit more of my day job. My wife and I own an online fitness and nutrition coaching company. And I also life coach. And so if someone's listening, I think your audience would be more inclined to pick my brain in a life coaching capacity. I'm here for a fitness capacity as well, but fitness shaman on Instagram. Yes, there are three S's in the middle of that. Don't be tripped up by it. And then if you would like to see more of what my day job is like, that's at DLD Nation. And then lastly, I have a podcast, which Sabri, I would love to have you on. It's called at Shots to the Dome podcast. We're on Instagram, Spotify, everywhere podcasts are played. Amazing. Brother, thank you so much for being here. It was, uh, it was amazing. Yeah, thank you again. I'm excited to come back. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to find Sean, the links are going to be in the description below. If you want to join me on a Thursday for the free group call, the self-exploration call that I host, the link is also there for that. And lastly, if you haven't yet subscribed, if you enjoyed the conversation, please hit the like button, hit subscribe, and it really helps us out. All right. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.